Good morning, Liberty. It is Monday morning, April 8th, 2019. My name is Michael Bolden, broadcasting to you live from here in my home office and studio in downtown Los Angeles for the 10th Amendment Center. It is 9.30 a.m. Pacific time. So good morning to you, good afternoon, good evening. Whether you're watching live in any of our simulcast locations, Facebook, YouTube, Periscope, or later on in the archive, or listening just through iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts, I'm very grateful for you spending some time with me today. I did have a, a pretty... Yeah, I want to apologize for everyone who is really counting on me to do a, a consistent Monday, Wednesday, Friday, 9.30 a.m. Pacific Time show, which is what I really believe in. I believe it's important to be very consistent about what you do, not only in your message and your work, but in the timing. So I've often promised that as every Monday, Wednesday, Friday, the last couple of weeks, I've had to be off on Friday. I did have a a great couple of days. I took actually a couple of days off hanging out with my buddy Mike Meharry, who's worked with us here at 10th Amendment Center. I think it's about a decade now. He visited from Lexington, Kentucky, so we hung around and just ate and relaxed and laughed, and then we did a road trip up to the Bay Area where I gave a speech uh, s- uh, sponsored by the Libertarian Party Mises Caucus over at lpmc.org. Org, I believe, is their website, and that was really cool. Got to see some uh, uh, some really good people up there in Northern California. Now, in today's show, now that we're back to our normal schedule, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, 9.30 a.m. Pacific time for the live stream. Of course, archives all the time. Now we're back with the normal schedule. I thought I wanted, I, th- I wanted to cover something in a little bit more detail on strategy, but applying to the right to keep and bear arms. We often talk about various efforts to protect gun rights, and I think most of them focus on various filings and lawsuits and court strategies. And if you've listened to me talk before, you know I propose and recommend strongly using what James Madison advised in Federalist 46 to disobey, which was what was uh, the word repugnance was defined in how Madison used the term repugnance, people's repugnance, disobedience, non-obsequious, not obedient in Madison's terms, or a refusal to cooperate with officers of the union using legislative devices to make that happen. Now, that is a piece of the puzzle. But a problem that we run into often is that states are often sometimes worse than the federal government. They have more gun control laws on the books or localities, or they just have concurrent ones. And I think a lot of times you see things like the National Firearms Act of 1934, which shouldn't exist. You find concurrent laws on the books in regards to the same types of things, but on a state level. Now, this was the same thing that was going on in regards to marijuana. The feds have been telling us for decades that they have the power, even without a constitutional amendment, to render a plant illegal. And in the 2005 Gonzalez versus Rage case, Justice Scalia wrote for the majority that if you grow a plant in your own backyard, you never buy or sell it and never cross the state lines, it is consumed in your own home. This counts as interstate commerce. Well, the more states that legalize what the feds have prohibited or simply decriminalize what the feds want them to criminalize, it's made it almost impossible 
for the federal government to enforce their prohibition. And we know even from FBI statistics, and I'm not sure what the most recent year is, it could be different than this now, but it's somewhere between 95 and 99 percent of marijuana arrests happen under state law by state agents, not by feds, because the feds don't have a lot of agents and they're very happy to see the state's criminalize things that the feds want them to criminalize. Maybe there's some funding that goes on. Uh, they get some asset forfeiture cash, whatever it may be. Highway funds, whatever they twist their arms with. But we've seen it play out differently on weed. I'd like to see it play out differently on the right to keep and bear arms as well. We've pushed this type of message, but I don't think we've pushed the decriminalized message nearly enough. We started seeing some bills introduced in recent years, and I want to cover some not just on sound suppressors, but I also want to talk about uh, constitutional carry, which I think is a bad term. Some bills in Alabama, where my buddy EHP Training, I know, is working to get that passed in Ohio, but then also in some legislation that's passed on sound suppressors in Arkansas, Tennessee, and then an interesting bill that's being considered in Missouri. So I'm blabbing a lot before getting to all the reports and, and the articles that I want to cover today. I want to say hi to some friends out in the live chat. Dan Reed says, good morning from Soggy, Oregon. Good to see you, Dan. Dan uh, was really kind enough to host me on his podcast, The Culinary Libertarian, a couple of weeks ago. Anna Ray's EHP Training, who I also mentioned over on YouTube, Justin Bayola, Promote Liberty, Frank, I, uh, Greg, and Tom over on Facebook. Uh, Joseph Standridge, Bonnie, I appreciate everybody for joining me. And I think I've got a nice new setup now that I'm using the Restream tool to broadcast through these uh, various channels at the same time. They have a nice chat application where I don't have to switch between tabs to find out who's where. I was kind of struggling with that over the last couple of weeks. But I set up my a second computer, a laptop in front of me. That uh, helps me keep on top of it. Uh, also, hi to Richard Hengi. No victim claiming harm means no crime. Yeah, you know... That's a very big point. A lot of people want to criminalize what you own rather than what you do with it. And that is a real problem when people are afraid of something. And I know back in the in the mid 90s when I first started kind of noticing things, even though I was a complete moronic socialist Marxist clown, I had no idea what I was talking about, about uh, the structure of government. I've learned quite a bit. I have a long way to go still. But. People always want to block what you own as if you might do something. It's almost like pre-crime, like if you own a plant, if you grow weed in your backyard or hemp, well, that might give other people the opportunity to hide cannabis THC plants in your hemp fields, which is nonsense. Or if you grow hemp and you consume it, you might later on be wasted and get into a car accident. Or if you own a gun to protect your home, you might at some point be a bad person and go out and just murder a bunch of people. And this is the fear mongering that they use. But really, if we're talking about principles of liberty, it's what you do that you're responsible for, not what you own or what you eat or any of these other things. And I think I'm kind of rambling along a little bit too philosophical uh, on this. But Dennis Marburger over on uh, Facebook says the property rights issue is huge here, isn't it, Michael? And yeah, that I mean, that's really what it gets down to. That's the foundation, the foundation of self-ownership, what you eat, what you own, what you ingest. This is a property rights. I have I am my own property. And then my the property that I rent, I have an agreement with my landlord that I can do. I mean, there are restrictions on it, but I agree to this in advance. This is what this is my property. They can't just enter here. This is my domain. If you own the ground. Well, of course, people will tell me, I know there's property tax things. here. You don't really, really own it, but that's a, a completely different issue. Anyways, I'm rambling on that. I do want to get into a couple of articles that I think you'll find interesting here. First of all, we reported just late last month in March, a, a bill that was signed into law in Arkansas. And T.J. Martinell, who also does a podcast as well, I wish I knew it off the top of my head, the link to it, uh, but T.J. does a really interesting podcast. He's been doing a ton of great blogging for us, uh, primarily on the right to keep and bear arms issues and bills on the state and local level. And he covered this bill in in uh, Arkansas that was signed by Governor Asa, or Asa Hutchinson, SB 400 was signed into law, I guess, around March 19th. And this is how he puts it. Last week, Arkansas Governor Asa Hutchinson signed a bill into law decriminalizing the manufacture and possession of firearm suppressors in the state. 
lot of people want to call them silencers. I have often called them silencer. It actually puts silencer in quotes in the title of the article, especially if you're watching here on, on video, you can see that. I think it's important uh, to use the proper term because silencers, they're not silencing, they're suppressing, reducing the amount of sound. But most people call them silencers, so we still put that in the title. Just It's, it's a little clickbaity in order to encourage people to, to read, and then maybe we have a paragraph that includes a little bit of a description about it pretty high in the article. But he signed a bill that decriminalizes the manufacturer, so what you make is, shouldn't be a crime, what you own or possess shouldn't be a crime, of firearm suppressors in the state. And TJ goes on and says, the new law not only removes a layer of state regulation, it will help foster an environment hostile to federal gun control in Arkansas. And I think that goes back to my marijuana example. There are very few, if almost none, I, I, I don't want to say zero because I'm assuming that I'd be missing one, but off the top of my head, there are no marijuana sanctuary jurisdictions where they're actually going out and interfering with federal agents who want to actually arrest people for uh, conducting business or owning marijuana or consuming hemp or whatever it may be. They're primarily just legalizing or decriminalizing and letting the market. This tells me that the market is stronger than government. So as long as there are enough people who want to do something, it doesn't matter what Washington, D.C. says. It doesn't matter how many people they throw into jail because eventually the market overwhelms that. And they did throw a lot of people in prison over a plant. In the early days here in Southern California, there were people who ran dispensaries that were going to jail for 10 years, five years, over and over and over under the Clinton administration. And then the Bush administration, they really ramped it up from there. One guy actually, I think from West Hollywood, he actually died in prison because he was selling something that the federal government did not want him to sell. And mind you, this was even after the state legalized, the state law enforcement even helped the federal government carry this type of thing out. But anyways, going back to the right to keep and bear arms and these so-called uh, so called silencers, Bob Ballinger introduced SB 400 earlier this year. The new law repeals current Arkansas statutes prohibiting the possession, manufacture, transport, repair, or sale of firearm si silencers, more appropriately referred to as suppressors. It also removes a prohibition on, quote, a firearm that has been specially made or specially adapted for silent discharge while modifying the prohibition on certain weapons so that a, pro a person must knowingly possess or sell them. So they're just taking a layer out. Let's say this has no effect. Let's say it has no effect in the courts. Let's say it has zero effect on the federal government. I personally would call this an important first small step because there is zero reason to criminalize the ownership of these products. So if Arkansas is going to do anything, the very first thing they absolutely should do is stop having it be a criminal uh, act under state law. The, the least you can do is say we don't consider it a crime. The next step, of course, would be to say we're not going to help anybody else who wants to consider it a crime. They're not doing that here. But this sets the foundation for that to possibly happen. Now, if the feds, if the Trump administration gets aggressive I guess the first step is really the market. If the market decides that they're willing to take the risk against 6,100, uh, uh, actually 5,500 or so ATF agents that cover the entire country, and they recognize that the state is no longer con considering it a criminal act, and they're willing to risk, and if enough people are willing to risk that, it's going to be very difficult for the federal government to do that. But the problem is, early on, a lot of times the state will help the federal government do the enforcement. So the follow-up has to be to refuse to participate. Uh, TJ points out here again, suppressors m simply muffle the sound of a gun. They do not literally silence firearms. Nevertheless, the federal government heavily regulates these items under the National Firearms Act. They charge a $200 tax on the purchase of the devices. As long as you go through this months-long months wait, months long wait from the ATF, which shouldn't exist, you ha basically have to beg for permission from the ATF, which shouldn't exist, to exercise a right. If you're having to get a permission slip from any level of government, you're not exercising a right. You're getting you're granted privilege. It is a privilege, and that's a problem.
So a part of the puzzle, of course, to decriminalize. So the power to tax, the power to destroy, the power to require permission slip, of course, is the power to destroy because they can withdraw that permission, of course, at any time. They can stop giving people permission. Here in California is a great example of this. There is a concealed carry law on the books. You can do concealed carry in California, but then there's the caveat. You have to have the permission of the sheriff in your county. And here in Los Angeles County, they've only given out like 30 in decades. And the current sheriff, I can't think of his name, but he is a horrible monster. This guy, there are 30 people that have been basically grandfathered in since the 80s. He's actually trying to get, he's going to state court trying to get these grandfathered concealed carry permits. Again, the permission slip is the problem because then government eventually comes after them. So people thought they had a lifetime permission slip. Now, the current sheriff is saying, you know what, the, the circumstances that created a life or death situation for these people is over. Now they're 30 years older. I would think it's even more important for them to be able to defend themselves uh, with, with a firearm in situations where there's absolutely no way they may have the physical strength in a hand-to-hand -hand situation. I, I think that's an important consideration. But this monstrous sheriff wants to take away their permits that have been grandfathered in for all this time. So you can't trust them with permission slips. And of course, you don't want to trust them with the power to tax on these things. And TJ goes on, he says, the repeal of state suppressor restrictions will not alter federal law. And I do want to make that clear. This does not do that, but it's a piece of the puzzle. But it does remove a layer, he says, of law hindering access to these harmless devices. I love that he put that. The widespread easing of suppressor regulation in states subtly undermines federal efforts to unconstitutionally regulate firearms. And he goes on, he points out, this is similar to what we've seen. This, not that we've seen people actually take the ball and run with it on this, but this is the type of thing that sets the stage. A couple of decades ago, this was the type of approach that was solely being used on weed. And he says, we've seen this with marijuana and industrial hemp. A federal regulation becomes ineffective when states ignore it and pass laws encouraging the prohibited activity or when the state decriminalizes and people start ignoring the federal prohibition without any further state permission to do so. Again, as I pointed out in my speech up in Concord Bay Area over the weekend, the ATF only has about 5,000 agents for the entire country. They have a capacity of about 8,000 closed cases per year with the assistance of state and local law enforcement. Now, it, let's say there were 10 or 11 million undocumented, illegal sound suppressors all in violation of the National Firearms Act. There's no way that they could do it. Now, we want zero enforcement. But of course, as Thomas Jefferson told us, you're not going to get from tyranny to liberty in a feather bed. And this is people eventually have to take risks to advance liberty. So the, uh, this is not the first time that we've seen somebody do this. And I'm not sure because we haven't really dug deep into this. I'm really I'm kind of just kind of exploring this with you now. I do know that this just got signed into law in Arkansas. I'm not sure when it goes into effect. 90 days. So sometime this summer, this will go into effect in Arkansas, removing it from state code that this is a criminal activity to possess, to repair, to manufacture, to own a sound suppressor in Arkansas. But they're not the first, and maybe they're not the second either. I don't know. Maybe some people in the live chat, uh, I don't know if EHP or anybody knows what's going on on this in other states. I do know specifically that we covered a similar action. Just kind of, again, I want to really start digging into this over the summer in the non-nullification legis uh, legislative sessions. We call it nullification season outside of the state legislature say your sessions for and then look into it more for 2020. Are there other states with laws on the books that have decriminalized sound suppressors? We know for sure two years ago in in Tennessee, uh, July 15th, July 5th, 2017, Mike Meharry reported that the week prior, a new Tennessee law went into effect decriminalizing the manufacture and possession of firearm suppressors in the state, the House passed, it was Senate Bill 921 from Senator Steve Sutherland. I'm not sure if Steve is still in office there. Maybe he is. Uh, Senate Bill 921 by a vote of 74 to 18, and the Senate approved the measure by 28 to 1. So even though it's a Republican-dominated legislature, 
there's only one person that voted against it. Now, there aren't a lot of Democrats, but uh, some of them voted for it as well. They understand the idea of decriminalizing. Why should we have this on criminal law? There's a, maybe the argument, and I've heard this before, we don't need to have a criminal law on the books here in the state because they already have it on the federal level. On the other hand, I can't remember what episode, but recently I was talking about uh, an effort by Moms Demand Action or whatever that gun grabber group is. They were in Missouri. They were complaining about an effort to repeal a gun control measure, and they didn't like it because they recognize they actually have started to catch on. They recognize that the feds actually can't enforce. And so they really wanted to keep the gun control measure on the books on a state level. And I think the more that they catch on on that, the more they're going to oppose these types of things, because we are not getting a lot of opposition in the few cases that we see this type of thing come up. So in Tennessee, we know that there is a law on the books already in effect to decriminalize. Are people actually doing this in violation of federal law? I'm not hearing about it in Tennessee. Eventually, people are going to have to do this. James Madison told us, father of the Constitution, if you want to undermine federal co programs, he didn't say you have to vote the bums out or sue them in their own courts. He said you have to disobey them. You have to disobey them, and then your state and local communities they have to stop cooperating in the enforcement of those those federal acts. That's how you defeat them. So this is the first piece. In Missouri, there's a really interesting bill that I've covered briefly on a short live stream earlier this year. House Bill 302 that takes this kind of marijuana and gun rights, property rights message to another level. House Bill 302 from Representative Ron Hicks. Any person with significant hearing loss could legally possess a firearm sound suppressor, commonly referred to as a silencer. If they have a written certificate from a licensed medical doctor, ontologist, or neurotologist attesting that the person has significant he hearing loss and that a firearm silencer would be beneficial to preserve the person's remaining hearing, they could legally possess a firearm sound suppressor under state law. See, we're still kind of waffling between silencer and suppressor there. We're going to get better at that over time. My apologies, uh, even as I read through this. Currently, Mike Meharry writes in this article, Missouri enforces federal regulations on firearm sound suppressors by making their possession in violation of federal law a state crime. Now, I think Ron Hicks is actually being strategic about this. He's recognizing that people, the, the beginning of the marijuana legalization effort that is 33 states strong now and totally crushing, wiping the floor with the Fed's policies. They haven't totally won yet, but it's getting very close. In 2015, I had said uh, in a video, basically, sooner or later, the Feds are going to have to decriminalize and totally back off just to save face. Otherwise, they're going to look like total clowns. They're going to we've got this law on the books and everybody else is legalizing. Oh, they're going to look bad. They're eventually going to have to repeal. Although, as you may have seen a few episodes ago, uh, I talk about how the feds are holding on to this primarily because it's part of a United Nations treaty. They're enforcing U.N. treaties on prohibition. Maybe they'll do the same thing, you know, and but the end result is if the feds aren't enforcing because everyone's legalizing, then we're still more free. We'd like to get it off the books on top of it, but that is not easy with Washington, D.C. So this is an interesting approach. The people who really, really need a suppressor, people have lost their... I mean, of course, I, I, I know the argument is there that, look, I don't want to lose my hearing, so of course I want to use a suppressor, but that wasn't strategically how things started on medical marijuana either. If we look at what has been successful... It was people who were dying of cancer. Okay, we're going to let them use it because they need it. Well, someone else might not be dying or on their deathbed, but maybe they need some help. Certainly, we can recognize and acknowledge that a lot of people may want to use a sound suppressor for whatever reason, for reasons that I don't know. I've never used one. I want people to have the choice. I'm pro-choice. I want people to have the choice to be able to do this. But this is an interesting strategic approach. I don't think the bill has been uh, assigned to a committee yet, House Bill 302. Now, the Speaker of the House in Missouri has not even assigned this to committee. So if you support this kind of bill you want to call, and you live in Missouri, you want to call the Speaker and ask them to assign it to committee so it can have a hearing and a vote. That's how you got to get it done. So it's an interesting strategic approach. I think that's pretty good. Now, I want to also talk about constitutional carry here, but let me take a look here at the uh, at the chat. 
Michael Tubbs says they're called silencers because the guy that invented Hiram Maxim patented the device as a silencer. Okay, I didn't realize that. So maybe I was thinking maybe it was a propaganda term, and I didn't want to use that for that. Um, Anna Ray says government makes several laws to confuse us all and trap us all in. In Arkansas, hogging one's car horn at a sandwich shop against after 9 p.m. is against the law. Yeah, everything's criminalized. Promote Liberty says, I had to wait almost a year for some of my NFA items. Pointless except to discourage ownership. Well, kudos on you for pushing forward and having the patience. But they certainly do that. The more taxes, the more forms, the more difficult they make it, the less likely it is people are going to do it. And of course, the people who need to defend themselves the most, I would think the people who are living in the most dangerous areas are generally the poorest. So I know uh, the guy from Black Guns, Maj from Black Guns Matter, I heard he might be running for, Michael Heiss at uh, LPMC told me he might be running for city council in Philadelphia. He talks about this as well. You know, inner cities, you need to be able to defend yourself in poorer areas, more difficult areas. EHP Train says, I have a trust, but Otama messed that up. Promote Liberty also has a trust. And, oh, yeah. Many states, you have to choose between purchasing guns or weed. Yes. And I've talked about that quite a bit as well with friends. Like some people say, oh, you're not free in California. Well, we're not free in some areas and we're freer in other areas. Like I can walk down the street and buy some raw milk at the grocery store. And in many states, that's illegal. The best you can do is have part ownership in a cow. I can't own a gun. And I know you can own a taser, like one of those tasers with the laser sights. I was looking at that a while ago because a security guard said to me, look, man, you don't even need to shoot somebody half the time. If you point at some uh, drugged out homeless person, because I was walking through Skid Row and there's a lot of people, not that homeless people are bad, but there are people who have mental illness and drug addiction and things like that. And I was walking back and forth late night from late night from the studio that I had built at the time, which is now here in my home office. And he said, well, you know, you definitely want to carry this. So this is my 1.2% pepper spray. I also have this uh, self-defense pen. It's made out of, like, airplane metal. So, like, if you are in close quarters, you get somebody in a windpipe with this, is going to knock them out. But he also recommend for different situations, because it's almost impossible to get a firearm, uh, one of these tasers with a laser sight. He's like, if you just point the laser at someone's face, they're oftentimes going to run. But he said, and there is a police station, a substation right there, he's like, you really have to be, if you're open carrying this, which there's no restriction against, it's just that no one does, because the, the culture is fearful of self-defense. You always want to rely on the cops or our security guard or something. They say, I can't help you two blocks down the street, man. But you do have to be careful. The cops might see you carrying something in a holster and then think you're a threat. So, in honesty, I was too nervous about that part of it to actually get one. So I carry these two things when I have to walk through areas that are, are dangerous. So moving forward, let's talk a little bit about constitutional carry. I think it is... A bad term, we still use it because that's the popular term for it, because I don't want people to think that you get your right to keep and bear arms from the Constitution or from the Second Amendment. My gun, gun permit is not the Second Amendment. It was not ratified in 1791. My gun permit is my humanity. Even though I don't own a gun, I have the right to, and I want other people to be able to make that choice. Again, pro-choice of whether it is good for them or not. Well, in Alabama, uh, thanks to the heads up from my buddy down there, EHP, Senator, Senator Gerald Allen filed Senate Bill 4 on January 15th. I know it's a short session. Is I have not seen this even getting a committee hearing, but it is an important bill. The legislation would repeal several statutes related to carrying firearms and would allow any law-abiding adult who can legally possess a firearm to carry a concealed weapon without first having to obtain a permit. If passed, Mike May or TJ Martinell writes on this SB4 would take a small step returning to the original vision of the founders in which citizens had a duty to be armed rather than need a permission to carry. And this is this is just an interesting aside. He's written a number of articles on this TJ has and he says in the original 13 colonies, colonies, all but Quaker pacifist Pennsylvania required able-bodied men to have a working musket and respond to musters. It's why George Mason, Mason said at the Virginia ratifying convention that the militia was, quote, the whole of the people, 
except for a few public officials. The founders, he said, wanted militia to defend the colonies, not a standing military that could threaten liberties. So the more we encourage this culture of self-defense, the more that we get closer to the vision of the founders, we don't have to rely on massive standing armies, which the founders warned us against. James Madison specifically said, and I mention this repeatedly, armies and debts and taxes are the known instruments for putting the many under the domination of the few. We should be more self-reliant rather than counting on government to be so huge that some bad guy or bad woman is going to get in there and use it in a bad way. So Senate Bill 4, this is a similar type of thing. It is decriminalizing concealed carry or carry with without a permit. So if you were to do that now and you don't have a permit, they could lock you up. So this would remove that from the required permission uh, slip requirements. Same thing with a bill that was introduced in Ohio recently. House Bill 174 was filed on March 27th from Representative Ron Hood and Representative Tom Brinkman. Oh, it looks like 25 co-sponsors. So this, under this proposal, a person aged 21 or older who is not prohibited from possessing a firearm under federal law, eh, it's a little too many caveats, but it's a step forward, would be able to illegally, would be able to legally carry a concealed deputy weapon without needing a license subject to the same carrying laws as a licensee. I think that's really, really important. I'm a big, big supporter of constitutional carry laws. And we hadn't been on board on this in the past because I don't think I understood the strategy. None of us did. And then all of a sudden, I don't know if it was just conversations between Mike, TJ, myself, maybe Dave Benner was involved in this. I mean, we all kind of just banter and share ideas, whether it's on our Facebook pages or Twitter or sometimes in our our own private workspace group, which is an app called Podio that we use. But at some point it was like, wait a second, there's no one's arresting DEA agents to legalize weed. It's just that tons of people are doing it, and they're they're doing it as soon as we see the state decriminalize or legalize. So why not use that same incredibly effective strategy on other things? And some people tell me, oh, they'll really they'll really go after you on guns. Well, they really go after people on plants. They just don't do it as much anymore. So if you ha- if you weren't paying attention in the mid '90s. You didn't know how aggressively they came in after people. And even on raw milk, back in 2011, the FDA and local police came in with full auto. Maybe it was assault rifles. That's in quotes. For those of you who are just listening, I don't like that term either. But maybe, but in 2011, they raided Rossum Foods in Venice Beach, hippie Venice Beach, California. They raided them full geared up, a SWAT team. Because they were selling raw milk and raw cheese and the feds don't like that. Maybe it wasn't within the purview of state law. We haven't seen those kinds of raids anymore. But I think uh, that kind of thing is really dangerous. You You can't just say the product is different so they're going to be less aggressive. Government, when they can get away with it, will use as much violence and force as possible to get people to comply. And, but the message is very straightforward, and this is what Madison said in F- Federalist 46. It's what I said in my speech over the weekend in the Bay Area uh, to the uh, California Libertarian Party annual convention. When enough people say no to these federal laws, when enough people say no to them, and enough states pass laws or cities pass laws backing them up by refusing compliance or legalizing what the feds prohibit— There's not much the feds end up being able to do to force those so-called laws, regulations, or mandates down our throats. Uh, Justin Bayola says Ruby Ridge, of course, they're they're extremely violent. And when you have a small number of people in one location doing things, the same thing happened with Mr. Cox and Kettler in Kansas, when they're the only two people uh, manufacturing uh, firearm accessories in violation of a, of the National Firearms Act and the Gun Control Act of, of 34 and 68 in Kansas. They're the only two really doing it out in the open. They're a much easier target. But they knew what they were doing, and they said someone had to take one for the team. Eventually, you're going to have to have a large numbers. We see a large numbers of weed businesses doing this, and I do, well, I don't know what the right path is for each person, but I do know in the end I'm going to side with James Madison. James Madison has said that this is how you get things done. Anyways, a quick hello to some friends out in the live chat. Uh, Justin Bayola and Frank and Anna and David Michael on YouTube. Uh, Dan Dumas and 
John and Dennis and Tom and everyone else on Facebook and Periscope. I'm very grateful for you spending some time with me today. I hope you found this interesting, insightful, educational, maybe a little irritating, whatever it may be. I really enjoyed spending a little time with you. I'm looking forward to being back on my normal schedule Monday, Wednesday, Friday, 9.30 a.m. Pacific time. If you enjoyed the show, you enjoyed this episode, you enjoy the, the show overall, whether you're watching live or in the archives, make sure you smash that like button. Continue leaving comments, even if it's later on. And of course, share the link. All these platforms that you watch or listen on are very easily triggered. So just doing those things triggers the algorithm to show the program to more people. So please continue to do that. I'm very grateful for you spending some time with me today. I hope you have an awesome Monday. And I'll see you next time here at Good Morning Liberty. Take care.